if lowering interest rates and doing QE and other monetary policies in order to weaken the <coughs> currency to fight a recession, what is it that you expect Japan and China and Europe to do when they go into a recession and the United States is doing QE and their currencies are running up 20 or 30 percent? Are they just going to sit by? While I mean, you, you just said that a weaker yeah, currency yeah. is the way to fight recession. Yeah. So now currency is rising in Japan. It's rising in Europe. It's rising in China. It's rising in Australia. It's rising in Canada. Yeah. Are they just going to sit by with with tighter monetary policy than the United States when they're exporters? Right. And and let the U.S. dollar go down twenty percent. They're certainly not going to do it happily, and that's the great question. How far can we push that sleeping bear, that sleeping tiger, that sleeping sun? In other words, that rising sun. And it's a fair point. And, and Welcome to Thoughtful Money. I'm its founder and your host, Adam Taggart. Well, we're in for a special treat today, folks. We'll be witness to a meeting of the minds between two top monetary experts who will each argue their own predicted path for the U.S. dollar from here. We're very fortunate to be joined by Brent Johnson, CEO of Santiago Capital and developer of the dollar milkshake theory, which will serve as the foundation upon which today's discussion will be built. Serving as a counterpart perspective will be Matthew Pippenberg, Commercial Director at Matterhorn Asset Management AG, Gold, Switzerland. I'm not sure we'll see a debate here so much as a co-exploration, as there are many points our speakers agree on, but there are definitely a few where they see things differently. And over the next hour, we'll drill down together on those points of differentiation to see if we can't make the path ahead for the U.S. dollar clearer to discern. Brent and Matt, thank you both so much for joining us today. Well, it's, thanks for having us. Looking forward to this conversation. This whole whole group together is great. Looking forward to it. All yeah, right, guys. Well, look, well, thanks for joining. And we're all from all over the world. So um, I'm in yeah. California out here on the U.S. West Coast. Uh, Brent, you're way over on the east side of the continent in Puerto Rico. And Matt, you're over in the old world, right? I believe you're in yeah. Switzerland today. Yeah. Yeah. So we're three different corners of the triangle, right? Yeah. All right. Well, the magic of technology, but um, it's going to allow us to have a great discussion here. Um, and Matt, you know, it was our interview from about two months ago or so where uh, th that's what put today's discussion in motion. Um, and Brent, I just saw you in, in New Orleans. Um, so many thanks for uh, a, a agreeing to accept Matt's outstretched hand here with, with some of the questions that he had raised for you in that discussion that I had with him. Um, and look, I've, I've got some prepared questions, but I'm going to hold to them loosely here. Um, you know, please feel free to ask questions of each other uh, and react to each other's points. To be honest, uh, if I don't even really get involved much in the, this conversation, that's going to be a win, I think, for everybody. Um, I did make the mistake of asking on Twitter if folks had questions for you guys, and no surprise, I ended up getting about 47,000. Uh, so I know I'm going to be disappointing all of those people pretty much. Um, I will shoehorn in a question or two of theirs if I can. But like I said, this is really a co-exploration amongst you two big minds on where the dollar is headed from here. Um, before we get into the meat of the discussion, I'm wondering if I can ask each of you uh, just a quick little, uh, for a little bit of perspective to set uh, the ground here. And Brent, why don't we start with you? Um, <clears throat> I know it's challenging, but can you just give the audience, for folks who aren't familiar with your work, just the 60 second version of the dollar milkshake theory, given that's gonna be sort of the basis of what we talk about here today. Sure, so uh, thanks again for having me. I, I think the best way to set this up is to explain first of all, what I do. And that is, you know, my whole lens on all of this is looking at it as a portfolio manager of other people's assets. So my goal in all of this is to try to protect the capital that they have and increase the size of their portfolio. Uh, I'm not coming at this from a philosophical standpoint. I'm not necessarily advocating for the things that I think will happen. I'm just trying to, again, look after my clients' portfolios. And when I do that, uh, there's several risks out there that I have to consider. And I think the biggest risk that many people just don't want to believe is that of a surging dollar. And, and the reason I think that we're going to end up with a surging dollar is because I'm someone who believes that debt matters. I think eventually that piper uh, has to be paid. And I think when that happens, the world is dramatically short US dollars. 
Uh, there will be a scramble to get them to pay them off to pay the debt off. And when that happens, I think uh, it will cause a global crisis. And I think it will be, it will be a sovereign debt and a sovereign currency crisis. The dollar milkshake theory is really the framework that I use to explain how that sovereign, how I think that sovereign debt and sovereign currency crisis will play out. And I think what happens is for many reasons, uh, and I've said this several times, some of them deserved, some of them undeserved, despite all the problems that the United States has, the United States also has a number of incredible advantages that the rest of the world just doesn't have. And I think that that will drive capital into the US dollar. I think it will drive what capital there is into the United States. I think you will see the dollar surge higher, uh, US-based assets outperform the rest of the world. I think the rest of the world will be deprived of the US dollar liquidity that they need. And as a result, I think you will see an outperformance of the US versus the rest of the world in a sovereign debt crisis. Uh, the, the name, the dollar milkshake theory came from the fact that I think the U.S. will drink the liquidity uh, of the rest of the world. And it's based on a movie called There Will Be Blood, where uh, Daniel Day-Lewis played a very ruthless oil executive. And the famous line from that movie uh, is that he said he will drink the milkshake of his competitor. And so that's that, that's what it is. And that's where the name comes from. Okay, great. Um, I know that there are a lot of nuances uh, to that framework. I think you did a great job of summarizing it in a very pithy amount of time. Thank you for that. Um, all right, so Matt, um, you and I did some back and forth in preparation for this discussion, and I just want to try to see if we can't just get out of the way early on the things that you and Brent agree on, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so we can focus the discussion on the areas where you guys uh, have... Mm -hmm greater differences of opinion. Yeah. Here's what I came up with, and, and feel free to add or edit this in any way you want. Mm -hmm. um, you, similarly to Brent, you think that there is a sort of sovereign debt spiral ahead of us. Mm -hmm. um, you do see that there will be uh, demand, certainly in the current here and now, uh, for US dollars. Um, the SWIFT system that we have is one of those great advantages uh, that mm -hmm. America enjoys uh, mm -hmm. that, that Brent mentioned. Um, there is massive power in being the world's reserve currency and having this euro dollar system that basically creates demand for dollars outside of the U.S. Uh, mm -hmm. And in parallel, we have the petrodollar, right, where mm -hmm. it is still the, the, the vast majority of transactions in oil, perhaps, you know, arguably the world's most essential resource uh, have to be done in dollars. There are some challenges to that, but still those are more on the, the fringes right now. Um, and uh, uh, derivative market demand for the U.S. dollar. Um, you're nodding as I'm saying all this. Um, are there any other sort of important elements of commonality before we get into areas where you guys see things differently? No, I mean, you, you also, you touched on so many of these, these straws of demand, this great sucking sound uh, to the milkshake theory, which I, I agree with. There's also just the trillions in in foreign U.S. dollar denominated debt, not necessarily debt that's owed to U.S. banks or to the U.S., but there is a great deal of debt. Uh, the number can be 14 to 16 trillion in offshore uh, entities or borrowers that have to pay back loans in U.S. dollars. That creates another source of demand. So there's a lot of things that you listed that we agree on. And, and in fact, I think most of what we agree on, I think you know, the global sovereign and debt currency crisis is an abstraction. And that despite all of its faults, which I think, um, you know, Brent has talked a lot about the faults and the bullying power of the U.S. dollar and the kind of absurdity of our monetary policies. And yet, the, despite these faults, the U.S. dollar still with the world reserve currency status has immense status and immense power to export its inflation, to be that bully in the playground that the rest of the world has to respond to with their own fiscal and monetary policies. Uh, I think we both agree that US, the US dollar and gold are supreme currencies, that they can actually go up together. They're not just inversely priced, uh, depending on the environment. That, you know, again, the euro dollar demand, the derivative demand, the petrodollar demand, the, the US dollar demand, the debt, the trillions there, the payment system that the US owns. Um, and I also agree with Brent that even the de-dollarization threat uh, to the US dollar, of which I'm a big, a uh, proponent of, as, as Grant Williams and I talked about in 2022, as soon as the sanctions began, uh, that was a watershed moment in 2022, just like 1970 was, 1971 was when, when Nixon 
welched on the U.S. dollar uh, as a gold, as, you know, with the gold backing. So there is a lot of things I think Brett and I agree on. In fact, it's not even things that I disagree on with Brett. And I, and I, I got to feel sorry for Brett, you know, because he comes up with this brilliant <laughs> thesis, this brilliant theory. We all really lean into it because it's compelling. And he very well could be right. So it's not like got to beat him down, but he's always in the witness chair. He's probably heard every argument before. I wanted to bring mine out, but I, I respect that the reason we're here is because he has such a compelling argument. So it's not something you need to beat down and defeat. It's something you need to unpack together. I think we and the audience need to really look at this U.S. dollar. I think in a nutshell, before we get into the weeds to your 60 second question, the issue, as opposed to just the debate or where Brent's wrong and I'm going to catch him, the issue that I wanted to talk about was Brent, because I think the milkshake theory, as he laid out, and I know it's unfair to try and lay it out in 60 seconds, but I think it's an exceptional uh, diagnosis of our current state of the world and debt and currencies and rates and central bank policy in general and the Fed in particular. I think it's an excellent diagnosis of the current state and even the prior state. Where I would take issue and where we can get into some discussion is, is it really a prognosis for the next five to 10 years? In other words, will we really see the DXY at 130, 140, the real spikes in the dollar? And, and, the, and the question or argument that I would make is, under natural circumstances, if you just look at that great straw, that great sucking sound from the derivative market and the euro dollar market and the U.S. denominated debt market, even the petrodollar market, there is this great, huge demand which puts upward pressure on the U.S. dollar and the DXY. And in all things being equal, that could very easily lead to a DXY of 130 or 140. But my argument is it won't happen um, because the U.S. and the U.S. Fed, despite all its warts and problems and, 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 and sins, uh, won't allow it to happen. And and it is the most powerful central bank in the world. It is the most uh, powerful currency in the world. And in my opinion, as Larry Leppard said, you can't, <laughs> you can't taper a Ponzi scheme. The U.S. Fed, the U.S. system, the U.S. policymakers understand the dangers of too strong a dollar. And despite all the distortions they've done to capitalism and all the sins they've done to supply and demand and free price discovery and natural bond yields and natural constructive destruction, even the U.S. can't afford for the dollar to get too strong for a number of reasons. And what they will do is what I think they've always done, whether it was in 2018, 2019, 2020, obviously 2008, is they will create so much immense liquidity uh, to keep the dollar weaker for a number of reasons we can get into. So that the, 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 even if the U.S. dollar would naturally go up based on this straw, this hoover of demand, and in the derivative market, it's like a roach motel. The dollars go in, they get tailed up in derivatives, and they don't even come out. So there's all this natural demand pushing the dollar up. I think the Fed will eventually, and, and right now I think they're just reloading their gun to eventually cut rates and print more money because every time there is a crisis, they ultimately resort to the fire hose because they can't taper. They can't allow yields to go much higher. They can't win trade deficit, the trade war, which they're losing to China. They can't get out of a recession with too strong a dollar. And my argument is the Fed itself can't endure a long dollar or a strong dollar, and they won't allow it. And I think that's where it might get interesting to see if I'm right or wrong or even close to, or if Brent agrees or disagrees. All right. Fascinating. And I'm just literally going to just lay the grenade down, pull the pin and, and slowly back away here and let you guys go. But basically we have Brent saying uh, the U.S. is going to take its mega straw and, and basically suck the liquidity out from the rest of the world. And Matt, you are saying, no, the power structure is going to be the soda jerk that's basically going to say free milkshakes for everyone yeah. uh, and, and flood the world with a lot more chocolate malted. Um, Brent. Respond yeah, to what so, Matt said. Well, I, I think the interesting thing for me with 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 this is that what what Matthew just said is not necessarily I don't necessarily disagree with it. So again, we get back to the things we agree on, uh, and there are many. Um, but I guess what I would say is that, and this is what I have said pretty consistently, that the dollar going lower is the Fed keeping control. That's the system continuing to exist as it currently does. So if the Fed is able to provide the liquidity that is necessary, and they do provide the liquidity that is necessary, and we don't get a spiking dollar, then we will have a situation exactly like we had over the last two or three years, where equity markets go up, commodity markets go higher, 
governments continue to function as they typically have, and the system will perpetuate itself, and the U.S. debt will even get bigger, and the rest of the world will borrow even more in dollars. And that can will get kicked down the road two or three years, and we'll get right back to where we are now with another debt crisis. And then they'll do it again, and they'll kick. But that doesn't, what that doesn't do, that doesn't get rid of the dollar demand. It increases the dollar demand. It doesn't solve the problem of the evils of fiat currency. It it reinforces the problems of the evils of fiat currency. Mm-hmm. Um, and it does not allow the rest of the world to get out from, quote, under the thumb or under the bully tactics or whatever of, of the United States. In other mm-hmm. words, it perpetuates the U.S.'s role in the world. It does not hurt the U.S.'s role in the world. Mm-hmm. And the U.S. still maintains that I'll use the analogy that uh, Adam just used, that grenade. The the U.S. can pull the pin on that grenade anytime they want. And I would argue that at least some of the rate hikes over the last 18 months are pulling the pin. Mm -hmm. And I would also argue that they are not necessarily as afraid of a recession as perhaps Matt thinks that they are. Mm -hmm. uh, Because I don't think that the, the U.S. can go into a recession I do not think that the United States can go into a recession or a serious recession without the rest of the world going into a depression. Mm -hmm. I don't think that that is functionally possible. If somebody can explain to me how the United States can go into a severe recession that would decrease its role on the global stage while the rest of the world rises and increases their role on the global stage, I would love to have that explained to me. Yeah, I know. And, and look, <clears throat> to a couple of points, I agree. I don't see how the rest of the world does well if the U.S. goes into a deep recession slash depression. Um, and I agree that if, if, if we go back to my thesis that when it's time to bend, the Fed will bend as they've always done in 2009, 2018, 2020, uh, during the COVID crash, during the repo crisis, that they'll always pull out the fire hose, create liquidity. If, if that's the case, then you're right. We just perpetuate this, this system of dollar denominated bullying, the confessions of an economic hitman writ large, just the U.S. really doesn't care about the rest of the world. To George Washington's point, <clears throat> we have no permanent friends or permanent enemies, just permanent interests. Our only interest is ourselves. The rest of the world takes our interest rates, takes our peg currency, and we'll do our best to exploit that. I don't even think the the, the current uh, Fed or FOMC with Powell in charge even is afraid of recession. I think they're actually using recession to engineer decreased demand to slow down the, the velocity of money or the supply of money and maybe the quote unquote fight inflation. I don't even think they're afraid of a recession. I don't think they're afraid of hurting the rest of the world either as they go through this period. Uh, look at what happened to Japan's currency. I think they somewhat allowed a 25% crash in the end so that Japan could support its bond market because it had to debase its currency to keep up with our rising rates. But I think what the U.S. is afraid of, you know, there was that famous quote by John Connolly in the 70s. I don't know if it was, it was to, talking to De Gaulle or Justang, where he said, look, it's our currency. It's your problem. Up until 1971, after the Bretton Woods, we had a gold back chaperone. We were an honest, good broker. We had a good currency. 71, we welched so Nixon could stay in power and get elected. And other presidents thereafter could print money at will. When, when Connolly said that, it's our currency, it's our problem, he meant it. And it was true. Uh, our currency, your problem. I think today for Powell and for the U.S., it's our currency and our problem. Because if if the dollar gets too strong or rates get too high, the cost of Uncle Sam's bar tab, his IOU, that yield on the 10-year or that strong dollar is kind of correlated to that yield. Then interest expense alone on the U.S. dollar-denominated debt, when deficits uh, to GDP get to 6, 7, 8% and the Fed funds rate are at five to 6%. That becomes 30, 40, 50% of our tax receipts. So we don't have any way to pay for our own debt. We don't want to default. Again, we'll go back to that instant liquidity, perpetuate this system and postpone, as you said, and can kick. And I think they will can kick. I think Powell's making a valiant effort maybe to slow down the system, but he'll never let it crash. He'll save it with more liquidity and he'll sacrifice the dollar in the end to save the system because it's not just saving the 10 year treasury or the bond market. It's also saving the pension system. It's also saving the risk asset markets, which is where they get their capital gains taxes for the top 10% who've benefited from the biggest market bubbles in history since, you know, Bernanke created these super fire hose in 2009. So there's a lot of incentives for the Fed 
to debase the currency, to save a system that it alone benefits from, that the top 10% get the most reward from, and then blame that need for liquidity on external events like Martians, COVID, Putin, the war in Israel, whatever. But it really is their own bathroom mirrors. And again, again, I could be wrong, but I think to your point, they will keep perpetuating it will only make the problem worse. And instead of that necessary constructive destruction along the way, which we've eradicated, we'll just have a very big moment of destructive, you know, destructive construction, constructive, destructive destruction. It won't be constructive at all, just be a massive implosion because I don't think the world will cooperate. And I'll stop there. It's a mouthful, but. Well, so, so how do you think, why, let's say you're right. Let's, let's, let's just accept that what you're saying is right. I do think that if the system comes into jeopardy, they will, of course, step in. That's literally why they exist in the first place. So I, yeah. I don't think we can disagree there. But if what you say is true, then why is the dollar 20% higher, 25% higher than it was before QE started 15 years ago? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, there is, because I that's the part where our agreement overlaps. The dollar is strong. Also, so what will they do differently this time? That, I think that will the, make it fall and stay down. Well, the, the, their only tools are pretty simple. Um, first of all, they could have extraordinary quantitative easing, the kind we wouldn't have dreamed of. You know, again, prior to March of 2022, when the Fed, when Bullard had promised, look, we're going to bring this down and keep it down. And it was, we went from 4.5 trillion to 3.7 trillion Fed balance sheet. Then we went to 9 trillion. That was extraordinary. Even in my most uh, cynical imagination, I never thought the Fed could expand the balance sheet that fast. Uh, and at the same time that they're cutting rates to near zero, um, I think what could bring the dollar, what could keep the dollar from going up, it's not going to be those forces in play already. All the things that are sucking on that straw that you described, those things will stay strong. I mean, you could argue that BRICS demand for the dollar could weaken or the petrodollar could weaken. There could be some things that could weaken it slightly, but doubtful. I don't see an eradication of the petrodollar anytime soon, although we could debate the degree of how important the BRICS de-dollarization really is. I think the real tool that will weaken the dollar will be artificial liquidity, synthetic liquidity that we can't imagine. I never imagined we go from 3.7 to 9 trillion in a matter of, of less than 16 months, the, the, the unlimited well, QE. So I guess I guess that's, that's the nature of my question here. So if, mm -hmm. if you could not imagine them doing as much as they did, and yet they did it, and yet they did it anyway. Mm -hmm. And the dollar still went to a thirty-year high. Mm -hmm. What what is it that you think they're going to do? Like, how much do you think they will need to do in order to make it go back to ninety, the DXY mm -hmm. to go back to ninety or eighty or whatever level you think it's going to? How much do you think they're going to have to do I, in I order think, to to, yeah. to accomplish that? I don't think eighty or ninety will be the target. I and mean, again, we're looking at, at, at rotating currencies. I think it is around the 100 to 110, 120, 115 level, not the 130, 140, 150 level. That's just unsustainable. I mean, again, they could use quantitative easing or other forms of magical liquidity through the back door, uh, through the TGA, all these things they've done with, the, with backdoor loan programs, or they could go resort to yield curve controls to try and control the dollar after they printed so much of it. They could open more swap lines like they did uh, with nine central banks recently in 2020 because there was so much euro dollar demand for liquidity. Because to your original point at the beginning, you know, you said eventually there'll be a shortage of dollars and eventually that will create a crisis. It will be even more demand for dollars, push the dollar up even more. But that crisis that a shortage of dollars creates is a liquidity crisis. In every crisis that I've either traded through, lived through, or studied is ultimately a liquidity crisis. And the only way to solve a liquidity crisis is massive amounts of unbelievable artificial currency debasing liquidity, which is why I think we share a common view on gold. But again, how much sure. QE would it take? Uh, I don't know. The other thing that's possible to answer your question, because I don't have the answer, the other thing that's possible that's been telegraphed by the IMF is some kind of, you know, again, I don't want to use the word debt jubilee, that's absurd, or some type of reset, more like a plaza accord, like we saw when the dollar got too strong in the past, where the country sat down together and artificially recreated the rules of the playing field because the dollar just was too strong for everyone else. Some type of uh, star chamber of mediocrity, which is the central bankers of the world, will get together and blame this strong dollar and this currency crisis and this liquidity crisis on everything but themselves and then reset the chessboard in a way that I don't have the math to really answer, but it could be either massive liquidity, yield curve controls or swap lines or some reset, which the IMF telegraphed during the COVID crisis conveniently.
Hey, Matt, I just chimed in because there, there is a third option, but I think mm -hmm. this is a point of commonality between the two of you, which is you could just let defaults happen. But I, I believe you mm -hmm. guys think no sitting politicians will allow that to happen. Yeah, yeah. Good point. Good point. Well, I, I don't I don't totally disagree there. Um, like I said, when the system itself comes into trouble, they will absolutely step in. That, that is their role. But they don't have to step in to save Thailand. They don't have to step in to save Turkey. They don't have to step in to save Italy or Greece mm -hmm. or Japan or China. Mm -hmm. And I would argue that they know this. They know what they need to do to perpetuate the system. Mm -hmm. But they're not doing it. I guess this is my point. Why, if, if this is what they need to, to you know, if, if the U.S. is in so much trouble mm -hmm. and the rest of the world has us right where they want us because of all of the fiscal sins of the United States, and why aren't they, why aren't they doing it now? Like, mm -hmm. why are they raising rates? Mm -hmm. Well, again, is, I, that's a great question. I'll give you my view. First of all, this is my point at the very beginning. I think the milkshake theory is a great diagnosis. I disagree that it's the prognosis because I think they will do it, as you say. And why aren't they doing it? My personal opinion is, first of all, I've always said that uh, Powell's war on inflation, I'll just say it was an open lie. Raising rates and cutting the balance sheet and QT while he's raising rates to me was never about inflation. First of all, I think inflation is a completely misreported open lie and joke in Wall Street. I think it's a great narrative to justify raising rates and cutting the balance sheet, which he tried to do throughout 2018 that ended in disaster by Christmas and New Year's of 2019, where the volatility was 10,000 basis points a day. My reasoning or my thinking of what the real motive for Powell tightening the balance sheet and raising rates, usually, you know, rates is, as Gundlach says, you, you the, the Fed takes the stairs up and an elevator down. They raise rates really slowly and then let them fall. This has been the elevator up, and I think it'll be the elevator down. The, the scope of the rate hikes in the last 18 or 16 months is so extraordinary. But I think what Powell is doing throughout 2022 and 2023 is what he tried to do in 2018, is, is, is reduce the balance sheet and, 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 and raise rates so that when the recession that he knows is inevitable, when the depression, recession, national and global become so grotesque, at least the two tools he has rates and balance sheet are reloaded because if we had a major recession at the zero bound with the fed balance sheet at nine trillion and rates at 0.25 percent and something hit the fan what would powell have to do he couldn't reduce rates anymore and, it, and the balance sheet was already so fat in my opinion it could be wrong i think he's simply using this opportunity and this narrative of inflation to give a few more bullets to each revolver in other words well now i have rates i can cut and now i have a little bit smaller balance sheet not much that I can expand when, when, when the recession comes, because if we do hit a recession, very few recessions are curable at high rates. They just, you're going to need low rates and you're going to need more liquidity. I think he's desperately trying too little, too late. What he tried to do in 2018 to reload his guns and have some tools left because the fed only has two tools, the price of money and the well, supply of money. Well, okay. So let, let, let's focus on that for a second. So I, I think what you're saying is the, the main tools to fight a recession, is to lower rates and to do QE. Is that is that fair? That's two important tools. I think the other reasons they would like to see a weaker dollar is would help with our trade deficits. We're getting crushed on exports when our dollar is too expensive. I think okay, the other so, reason. Yeah. Okay, but yeah, but the point is is that the way that central banks fight or the Fed fights a recession is mm -hmm. to go from tight monetary policy to easy monetary monetary policy to weaken the currency in order to solve you know the debt problems the velocity of money problems the trade problems and is, one is more fair? problem okay. yeah and one more problem again and i throw out there this is the the point that luke roman made and the st louis fed made this june is the other reason i think we're going to see an inevitable return to massive amounts of liquidity is because inflation will become out of control the current policy of raising rates to quote unquote inflation and, and, and raising the yields uh, and, and, the, and the, the downward pressure on treasuries has caused yields to do more work than the Fed funds rate in crushing the U.S. bond market. And I think, but regardless of that, as the yields rise and as the FFR rises or now pauses, the cost of Uncle Sam's debt becomes unpayable because it's not going to come from GDP and tax receipts. And so the very nature of the war on inflation through rising rates will cause inflation because the only way to pay that debt 
and pay those interest expenses, which are going to be 30 to 40 percent of our tax receipts, will be the fire hose approach, the mouse click approach, the money printing approach, the instant liquidity approach that they've used over and over and over whenever there's a crisis, whether it's a repo crisis, the great financial crisis, whether it was 2020. That seems to be their MO. And I think they'll need to print more money just to avoid default and to keep yields under control in some way. Again, those are my arguments. Uh, I, I don't so, know. Okay. Yeah. So I think, again, I, I don't, I'm, I keep, I'm asking for clarity because I don't want yeah. to misrepresent your yeah. position, but, but I, I, as I understand it, the Fed knows a recession is coming. And when that comes, the best way to solve the problems is to move from tight monetary policy to easy monetary policy. That is, you know, there's much, many different tools and right. things that they can use to fight that, but they've got to move from a strong currency to a weak currency in order to fight the recession. Mm -hmm. Is that is that fair? That's certainly fair. And sadly, okay. the other so thing the, I left out was was war too as another option. Just to throw right. it. Okay, so option. let's let's go back to fighting a recession for a second. So, if lowering interest rates and doing QE and other monetary policies in order to weaken the <coughs> currency to fight a recession. What is it that you expect Japan and China and Europe to do when they go into a recession and the United States is doing QE and their currencies are running up 20 or 30 percent? Are they just going to sit by while I mean, you, you just said that a weaker yeah, currency yeah. is the way to fight recession. Yeah. So now currency is rising in Japan. It's rising in Europe. It's rising in China. It's rising in Australia. It's rising in Canada. Yep. Are they just going to sit by with with tighter monetary policy than the United States when they're exporters? Right. And and let the U.S. dollar go down 20 percent. They're certainly not going to do it happily. And that's the great question. How far can we push that sleeping bear, that sleeping tiger, that sleeping sun? In other words, that rising sun. And it's a fair point. And, and that is the question. You know, if, if the dollar gets weaker to stave off a recession and here, what does that do to Chinese exports if the yuan gets stronger or the yen gets stronger and they're not competitive? And all's fair in love and war and all's fair in currency wars. And it's not a hot war yet, but it's a currency war. And that's the way we're going to we're going to use our our weapons. But that goes to the point you made, which, again, I don't necessarily disagree with. We have a choice. Pollyannishly, we can all agree to cooperate in a John Nash way. It makes more sense under quantum physics if we cooperate rather than compete. And because if, if if Europe's hurting and the dollar is strong or the, the rest of the world, the euro dollar markets are hurting and the U.S. is strong, that's not sustainable. If the U.S. is strong and the rest of the world is hurting, that's not sustainable. In a perfect world, we all get along. We all cooperate. The problem is I haven't seen any examples of that literally ever in the financial, military, political history of humankind. There are windows of it where we cooperate against common enemies, but we very rarely see the shared humanity, the shared economy, the shared intelligence of a cooperative system. So to your point, yes, if we did use QE and lower rates to help America at home, uh, Japan and China be damned, quote unquote, is going to be the attitude. And that, won't, and that ultimately comes back to hurt America. And again, I hope I'm wrong on that. I, I don't know. These are the things that can unplay or unravel in this lose-lose scenario, I think we're in failing total co global cooperation uh, and free trade and and, and, and trust, uh, which I don't see coming. Well, I guess this this is where I struggle. Like, if you don't see the solution coming, then how can the dollar go lower and stay down? I I can I'm with you. I can see how it can go to ninety five. I can mm -hmm. see how it can go to eighty, but I don't see how it solves the problem that you want to solve. And it eventually, won't... you 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 the only way for this to result. The only two ways that I can find for this to be resolved mm -hmm. is for the U.S. to artificially and proactively devalue the dollar mm -hmm. or to deal with a debt crisis where the dollar gets away from them to the upside. Mm -hmm. Anything in between those two just postpones yeah. the inevitable. Yeah, well, I actually. And again, Sat, I mean, for the point of suspense, I agree with you on that, too. And that's why. And so but do we agree then it's. It's unlikely to see the dollar or the DXY at 70, but it's equally unlikely to see it at 150. I can see. Well, so I would, so I would say, I would say that it's more likely to see it at 150 than one mm -hmm. than 70. And if anybody wants to make that bet with me, I'm happy to do it. Um, <laughs> yeah. I've actually got, already got, I've already got so many bets on here that. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But hey, uh, Bert, but I, yes, go ahead. One clarifying question there: um, Do you see the dollar as just sort of? you know, as you look forward, look out forward, it's just sort of inexorably rising um, in strength relative to all the other currencies. 
or do you see it more of like trapped in a cycle, like a sine wave where it gets up to 140, 130, 140, maybe even 150, then goes back down as, you know, the, the, the central planners take the actions that Matt's talking about, but then all the other countries start doing the same thing. And so the dollar starts rising again. So are we more sort of trapped in a, in an up and down yeah. cycle or are we more yeah. just inexorably rising? In my opinion, in my opinion, we're, we're in the cycle. I, I, I've said from, so the first time I ever started speaking about this was in May or June of 2016. I'm sorry, 2018 of 2018. And I, and I had said that in the years ahead, I thought that the dollar would go much higher, gold would go much higher, US equities would go much higher, they would all rise together, but it would be characterized by terrifying drawdowns along the way. And the reason is because of exactly what you just brought up, Adam, is that they can do QE and weaken the dollar, and that works for a while. But in or, but the rest of the world can't sit by and allow that, right? And if the rest of the world sits by and allow it, it sends them into depressions, which may so, you know, again, that, that on a relative basis helps the United States. But I don't think that they will just sit by. I think that they will try to manage their own economies as well. And this is, I've said several times, the more they print, quote unquote print, the higher the dollar will go. Because the U.S. doing QE just forces the rest of the world to do even more QE. And that is why the dollar was at 88 or 89 in, 19, in 2008, and it's at 106 today. Mm -hmm. And despite QE1, QE2, QE3, Operation Twist, the Volmageddon response, uh, the BTPs, you know, the COVID response, the helicopter money. I mean, think about everything that has happened since 2008. I mean, come on, that's a lot. And yet the dollar's up 25% from them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, and, and, and I can see that continuing to play out. It wouldn't surprise me if this, that same pattern played out for another 10 years. Mm -hmm. but, but if, if that continues to play out, that is not uniquely bad for the United States. Mm -hmm. It is, it does not drop the U.S.'s role in the world. It just mm -hmm. perpetuates the current crazy system that we have. Cool. And I, and mm -hmm. the, the last thing, the, let me just make this one point before I forget is I have to say I'm a little bit surprised that you think that the Fed can keep control. Mm -hmm. I actually think they're going to lose control. Yeah. But when they lose control, the dollar goes higher. It doesn't mm -hmm. go lower. Uh, no, and again, if they lose control, then we're, we're talking about, well, I think we're talking about a whole different paradigm shift. It's not necessarily unimaginable. I think it is, I, I'll never say it's impossible. There's a couple points, again, not to contradict you, but to take this further to evolve the thinking. Yeah. You know, when you talk about, you know, if they continue to QE and they continue to pr produce such massive synthetic, synthetic liquidity to save the system or control the yields or to keep America safe, that would be detrimental to the rest of the world. I would argue that for generations, that's exactly what America's attitude was towards the rest of the world, flippantly, but largely certainly in South America and in other developing economies it, it really was our currency your problem sign here on the loan we'll charge you a rate we'll mess with the currencies and we'll own you even though you're still under your own flag that is the mo of the great american system the point i'm saying but you say is the rest of the world's going to sit by and watch that and i'm saying actually they're not they're already not sitting by and not watching it and they are changing and again, I'm not one of those de-dollarization hype pluggers. What, like, what, what are they actually changing? What have well, they actually changed? It's just like when, the, when, we, when we took away the chaperone in 1971, the, the major currencies of the world didn't lose their purchasing power vis-a-vis -vis gold in one night. It was death by a thousand cuts. And what they're actually changing, again, some of its optics, I agree with you that most of these countries don't trust each other enough, to, certainly to have a gold-backed currency. But they do trust gold, and they can fill the delta in some of their... Uh, real asset trades in a basically a glorified barter economy with gold and other things. They're not going to let gold just be redeemable in Russia or China at a central Fort Knox there. But what they are doing, and again, I'm not saying D dollar Jason solves this and, and absorbs some of those milkshakes and becomes a new straw out of the dollar towards what the yuan, the ruble, the euro, the peso, the yen. That's not going to be the new world reserve currency. But what is, I think, a slow and steady pace that we can't ignore is very soon that, you know, the, the collective GDP of the BRICS is going to be higher than the G7. And if they can find a way to cooperate 
can make 42, 43, 44 bilateral trade agreements outside of the U.S. dollar. If the fact that the UAE and Saudi Arabia is joining the BRICS, again, I'm not saying the petrodollar ends tomorrow. I'm just saying there are things that they're no longer just sitting by. That doesn't mean they have a solution today or a solution tomorrow. And we can talk about the BRICS. But my second point would be to your earlier, again, it's a question, not a, a contradiction. If we get the DXY at 150, where would interest rates be in America? Well, so at 150, I think they probably do another Plaza Accord or they do another yeah. reset. Yeah. That, that 150 has kind of been my long-term okay. target. Okay. And really the reason I've said 150 is I think the all-time high is 160. And so I just threw out 150 because mm -hmm. it's really close to the all-time high. Now, I don't know whether it's ultimately 140 or 180 or 230. Mm -hmm. I think whenever we get to the ultimate terminal level, it, it probably does like a step function higher mm -hmm. <laughs> in a very short period of time mm -hmm. when that ultimately high level mm -hmm. is reached. And I think that will force, again, mm -hmm. the collective minds, the grand star chamber, the plaza mm -hmm. court, whatever. <laughs> right. But I, I don't think there's any way to solve the problem without something like that. Mm -hmm. um, because I just, I, I think the problem is too big. Mm -hmm. And, and the other thing I would, I, I would say is that, you know, I, I've had a lot of conversations about this whole, the BRICS versus the G7 mm -hmm. and, you know, these charts that show the BRICS versus the G7 and, you know, the GDP is going to surpass it. And it's not, it's not mm -hmm. going to surpass it. Mm -hmm. It's on, it maybe on a, some, PPP adjusted basis or some other, you know, handicapped basis that will pass it. Mm. Uh, but I don't think until after this crisis is resolved, I don't think it will pass it on an absolute basis because mm. it's not even close right now. Mm. And if we're, if to get through this crisis, we're going to have to do, you know, QE and we're going to have booms and busts and we're going to have war, then those GDPs are falling. They're not rising. Mm. And for them to surpass the United States, the United States GDP has to be, falling dramatically and those have to be rising dramatically. And again, I just can't, I cannot figure out a world where the US GDP falls dramatically and the rest of the world rises dramatically. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I find these, these, you know, alternative scenarios fun to think about, mm -hmm. but as far as, again, my lens of allocating assets in a portfolio to benefit from that, mm -hmm me there's no way to do that success and successfully profit from it so it's it's an interesting thought exercise mm -hmm. and i like that but but as far as practical real world applications mm -hmm. I, I don't see any mm -hmm. no i mean to your earlier point it's very different when you're talking about your fiduciary relationship to clients right. when you're managing yeah. money as opposed to having you and i have a debate will it lead to a 1f 150 dxy or hyperinflation in the debasement of the dollar uh, for me, as a as a as a commodity trader, a real asset trader, certainly the price of the dollar matters. But I think gold, and you and I probably agree, gold will go up regardless. And oh, so yeah. I can almost afford to be wonderfully <laughs> theoretical. Yeah, sure. Uh, sure. And yet, and yet, and again, I, I'm not part of the BRICS hype, but I do think it was a watershed moment. I think there are changing, uh, changing uh, icebergs floating around this sea now, changing watershed changes being made in global trade, global settlements. I don't think uh, the, the yuan or any other currency is going to replace the U.S. dollar. I do think its supremacy is still here, the U.S. Let, dollar. Let's, let's stay there for just one second. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but yeah, I don't yeah. want to forget. Let, let, let's say that there are moves being made, and let's say that they continue to be made. Mm -hmm. In that scenario, would you expect the U.S. to just sit back and watch it happen? Never. So what, what, what do you think they might do in, a, in, 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 in reaction to that? <laughs> Well, you could ask Gaddafi or Saddam Hussein, in a sense. I'm being right. glib. Okay. I'm being glib. So, so, no, 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 but don't be glib because this is real world stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And so I agree with you. I think if it came to that, they would do that type of a thing. Mm -hmm. So what happens to global GDP and their GDP in that type of a scenario? It's not a pretty scenario. And that's that raises right. my right. thought. Well, and then, and then, again, again why, it, mm -hmm. why couldn't they just raise interest rates and, and, and knock them out economically? They can. But again, then it causes when they raise rates to cause pain overseas, they cause pain to their own balance sheet here and their own IOUs. And then, of course, to solve that pain, since they don't have the money from GDP or tax receipts or manufacturing or production or a robust, resilient labor force, they're going to resort back to their old cocaine habits and they're going to print more money or mouse click more money to give more stimulus to an otherwise DOA economy right, and a but, DOA but, currency. But again, they've done that for the last 15 years and the currency is stronger than ever. 
So, but I, the, again, I, I, it's not that I disagree with you. It's just yeah. it doesn't have it doesn't have the effect you think it has. I, I don't think. Yeah. Can, can I inject one idea into this discussion? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Actually, two. One, because I just for, want to clarify for folks. Brent, you manage client capital, right? So you've got the fiduciary duty of giving them a positive real return on it. And Matt, you run a uh, hard assets business, but primarily mm -hmm. a gold storage business. Mm -hmm. um, I believe both of you share the thought that the purchasing power of the US dollar relative to real things, right? This conversation has been based on US dollar relative to mm -hmm. other fiat currencies, but, but it just it's purchasing power to buy things. I believe you both believe that that will be deteriorating over time, correct? I agree with that, but yeah, yeah. But, it, but that's why I throw in my terrifying drawdowns along the way, mm -hmm. because I, I think you're going to see much similar to what we've seen over the last either three years or 15 years, however you want to measure it, where prices will rise, but there will be draw, strong drawdowns along the mm -hmm. way. Yeah. You know, and you to can. Brent's point, is it's, you know, it really is more of an intellectual debate. I, I personally see not easily to forecastable hyperinflation, but severe inflation before I see the DXY at 130. But I, the, the point for me is I can afford to be more flippant about that because I think gold wins either way, given the volatility that we're going to see in the interim. But regardless uh, of which one so of us. I, I, I ultimately think this, just for anybody that knew that is watching, I've said from the beginning that gold will be the ultimate winner in all of this. Yeah. Great. That, and, and let, let me just put a pin in that because I, 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 I want to ask some questions about gold too. But the, the idea I wanted to inject, Brent, you and I were in New Orleans a week ago and George Gammon took the stage and he basically compared, you know, he said, look, I've sort of changed my thinking on the dollar. He was sort of in, you know, team dollar just gets weaker from here camp, but he did a forensic analysis of the historical data. And he basically said, wow, you know, like I, I used to think that it was the central planners who really drove the destiny of the dollar. And I'm now, you know, really looking at, at what's happened uh, empirically. And it really looks like the banks, specifically the banks that issue Euro dollar loans are the ones that have a much more direct impact on, on what happens with the price of the dollar going forward. So basically that the Euro dollar market is more important in terms of what happens with the relative price of the dollars than what the Fed decides to do at home. Brent, did you share George's opinions there, and I, I know this is yeah, a, a market this you look is, at closely. This is this is this is kind of especially for for people that are kind of new to this and trying to figure this all out. This is kind of the key thing to understand, or one of the key things to understand is that we can sit here and talk about the central bank's going to do this, the central bank's going to do that. But I think we both agree that markets are ultimately more powerful mm -hmm. uh, than than central banks. And what is necessary for the economy to continue to function is you need private banks to extend credit. You need velocity of money. And 90% of the money in the world comes from private banks or commercial mm -hmm. banks that doesn't come from central banks. Mm -hmm. And once you understand that the United States is the only country that can print quote unquote base money, mm -hmm. that is a key part of the problem. So what I mean by that is there is a US domestic dollar market and that is a debt-based monetary system. There's reserves at the Fed and there's currency, physical currency, that's base money. And all the other money that's in the system is loaned into existence. So that's a reserved system. And when you start to get drawdowns or when you get uh, you know, defaults, money disappears. And that's when the Fed has to come in and re-collateralize the system. They have to increase the base money that will then, in, in, a, in a size of which will encourage the central, the, the commercial banks to start making loans again. Mm -hmm. Now, that system in the United States is dwarfed by the same system outside the United States. And that system outside the United States also takes place in dollars. That's the Euro dollar market. But there is no entity in that Euro dollar market who can create base money. The only way the Euro dollar market can create more dollars is by extending new loans. And extending new loans means whoever's extending that loan has to put their own capital at risk. And the US has not done so, but the US has the ability to provide liquidity to the domestic market in times of crisis without providing it internationally. 
Now they have not done that. They have always done the whole, they've always provided whatever was necessary for the whole world. Mm -hmm. But if we were in a war or if we were in some kind of a geopolitical situation where we were not as cooperative as we have been in the past, the U S has the ability to withhold base money from the rest mm -hmm. of the world. So if that happens, there is nothing the rest of the world can do about it. Mm -hmm. And if they even, and if they do try to do something about it through some military way or some geopolitical maneuver, I think the volatility of the United States withholding the base money and the rest of the world trying to get it would create volatility on a level that would probably send the dollar to 150. Mm -hmm. No, well, I, think, I, think, I, I think that's important to understand. No, and it's an important point that, you know, George Organon made. I didn't see it in New Orleans, but, you know, you know, if you take that logic or that thinking, which is fair, and if commercial banks outside of the U.S. or in the European Union, the European Union where I'm sitting in, uh, you know, have a dollar shortage or there's a liquidity crisis there and they don't they don't have the power to create base money at the ECB or in Brussels. And they certainly don't have it at the Bundesbank or in the local individual banks of each of the of the countries in the European community. It's my point, my view, my opinion that in those inflection points, the U.S. will be selective and who gets the candy and who doesn't get the candy, who gets the liquidity, who doesn't get the liquidity. You can do the same thing with sanctions, sanctions on the SWIFT system or access to, you know, to SDR. Again, that that works against countries like Venezuela and Iran. They've done it in the past. It, it backfired dramatically and historically and irrevocably when they tried that against Russia, which even Obama warned about, Keynes warned about. Robert Triffin warned about when you weaponize the world reserve currency, you create distrust in it. But I think when there are all those inflection points where there's a need for liquidity, because those euro dollar markets and even those European commercial banks, they take dollars in, they weed them up into derivatives and options and swaps, and they're gone and they never come back and they're just levered instruments. And so there's a need for constant straw sucking dollars there, which I think the U.S. will provide at the expense of the inherent purchasing power of the U.S. dollar, which is so essential grease to this milkshake or ice cream think milkshake. I think, I think this is important to address here. I think when we talk about the Fed increasing base money or providing liquidity, mm. I think people often mistake <clears throat> new money being created with more money being created. Mm -hmm. The whole reason that the Fed would be providing liquidity is they would be trying to fill a, a rapidly expanding hole. Mm -hmm. They don't just provide liquidity out of the blue because they wake up one day and say, you know what, we want to splash some more water into the pool. No, it's always in a crisis. Always right. It's in a crisis, crisis when, when, liquidity, when liquidity is disappearing, they're trying to provide enough liquidity to replace the liquidity that is gone. So if we get into a massive default scenario, they could print 20 trillion and it might not be enough to fill the hole. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, what they have to do in these, in these scenarios, what they have to do is they have to, quote unquote, print enough to convince the private banks, the commercial banks, going back to Adam's point, to convince them to start risking their own capital and mm -hmm. making their own loans. Um, and, and I just I, I, I think that I think one thing to remember is to your point about, you know, the U.S. can do this to small emerging market countries without much worry. But if they do it to China or Russia or some of these bigger or Iran, some of these bigger countries, there's blowback. And so I, I would agree with that. There is blowback. Um, Matt, I don't know when you grew up, but I, I grew up in the 1980s. And uh, um, one of my key, it's so funny how you remember these things. One, one of my best sports memories from growing up in the 80s was when Marvin Hagler fought Thomas Hearns. Mm -hmm. And it was, I think it only went three rounds. And it's like, the, if anybody's never seen it, go on YouTube and look this up because it's an amazing boxing match. And in the very first round, Thomas Hearns hit Marvin Hagler so hard that he had a big cut above his eye and they almost had to stop the fight. Mm -hmm. But they were able to stop the, the blood. They didn't stop the fight. And Hagler ended up knocking out Hearns in the third round. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like <coughs> we're headed towards a major conflict. Uh, hopefully it just remains geopolitical and it doesn't become military. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, I think we'll probably get both. Mm -hmm. um, and I think all the players know that they're going to get hit. I don't think any boxer steps into the ring expecting to win without getting punched in the nose at some point. Mm -hmm. And so 
I'm of the belief that part of the reason that the Fed is raising interest rates is not just to combat inflation. Well, I think that's the primary reason. Mm -hmm. But I think they're also doing it to put the rest of the world under pressure. Mm -hmm. These are like body blows, right? They haven't gone for the knockout punch yet, but they're just, you know, rabbit punches and kidney punches and punches mm -hmm. into the arm and punches into the chest and punches into the stomach. Mm -hmm. And I think those higher rates, while they hurt the United States, the United States has the ability to print the dollars they need for their mm -hmm. liabilities. Mm -hmm. The rest of the world does not have the dollar does not have the ability to print the dollars they need for their liabilities. Mm -hmm. And so these are the body blows. This is the mm -hmm. U.S. just putting more pressure on the rest of the world. This is them leaning on them in the corner, right? Um, and so I, you know, I I want to make it clear that my thesis is not based on U.S. exceptionalism. I don't think we're smarter than everybody else. I don't think that we're better than everybody else. I don't think we're more moral. I don't think we have the moral high ground. Mm -hmm. In fact, I would argue it's because we don't have the moral high ground that we may be doing this on purpose. Mm -hmm. And I would argue that it's because we are the, bull the global bully that, we, mm -hmm. that, that, that we're doing it. And when I say mm -hmm. we, I mean the United States. Mm -hmm. um, and, and to think that I talk to so many people who just think that the U.S. cannot possibly come out on top of this mm -hmm. because of all the problems they're in. And my, my point is, is I get it. The United States has incredible problems. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're going to we're going to receive some punches as well. And we're going to get cut over the eye. I just don't think we're going to get knocked out. And I think mm -hmm. despite, you know, black eyes and bloody lips and hurt ribs, I think we will be standing. I think the United States will be standing when. Mm -hmm you know, these other countries hit the canvas. And I mm. think ultimately they'll just have to call the whole match and reset everything because, yeah, because, no, everybody, look at it. <laughs> because everybody will just be in too much pain to deal with it any longer. I agree. And I think I, I do see they're already telegraphing some type of reset, some type of Plaza 2.0 or, you know, Bretton Woods 2.0. They, they, they're conveniently pulling that off to your other points. though, whether the, whether that Plaza court or Bretton Woods 2.0 is motivated by a DXY at 150 or hyperinflation, because it is a very important distinction what takes us there. And it's very important to you as you're managing other people's money. And I'm not here to say that that's not a, a serious, serious issue, because it is, and you, and you need to take it seriously. And I, into your, <clears throat> your boxing metaphor there too, I think there is some truth to your point as well, validity to your point that America in some ways is raising rates to fight inflation. I don't think it is, but again, that's my opinion. I think I'm more cynical uh, about Powell and the mentality and the modus operandi, the profile of a Fed yes sayer but because anyway it's a longer story but to me even if you're right if if if, if and, and i think there's some truth to it if if we're raising rates to remind the world who's in charge who's got the biggest fist on the block who's got the toughest whatever the, the strongest bike or the strongest engine in the camaro on that corner street and i think there's some truth to that but at the same time while we're showing off our biceps you know we're bleeding out the ear, the neck, you know, under the arm from other wounds we're doing to ourselves because as we're raising rates to remind the world who we are, and again, not to get details, but 400 bankruptcies, the middle class all but eclipsed, the super poor getting handouts, the super rich don't care, and the middle class disappearing, 400 bankruptcies this year, the cost of corporate debt for small businesses up 20% from last year, delinquencies on credit cards and car loans, <clears throat> not to mention the bigger events like a banking crisis and a hidden bailout to the commercial banks by the Fed. See, you know, if we're showing the world how tough we are, we look really, really weak. And you're saying, yes, we'll get some blows maybe from China, but I think we're getting blows from ourselves. We're self immolating at the same time that we're showing how strong we are. I, not I to don't, mention, I, I'm sorry, I, I, don't, I forget, I, because if you look at what we've done militarily too, that credibility financially, after the fiasco in Afghanistan, the fiasco in Operation Freedom, and again, I never blame this on the soldiers, never. It's always the donkeys who push the lions into combat, the donkeys who are making the decisions. But when you look at the, the, the domino concatenation of disasters culminating in Afghanistan and probably now in our proxy war against Ukraine and where we go next in Israel, America doesn't look not only very smart, very statesmanlike or very amicable or peaceful. We look like a failed state desperately trying to keep ourselves distracted. As Hemingway warned, every political opportunist will debase the currency and distract us in war to grow our economy. My only point is, as we're fighting to show how tough we are, we're imploding from within. And that that is part of not just the theoretical issue of when we get to the 150 DXY or hyperinflation at home, we're already losing right now. 
in real time, without sensationalism, without drama, without gold or the treasury or the stock market being the main cause, don't you think the cost for the middle class is kind of a pyrrhic victory to show how strong we are to the rest of the world? Well, I and think, to markets ultimately. I, I, so I don't, I don't necessarily have a problem with any of the statistics that you threw out because they're right and they're good points. And again, the United States has enormous <laughs> problems that they're dealing with. I have a little bit of a problem when, and this is not directed to you, but when, when I talk to a lot of people who will make these same comments but they won't do the same analysis on China. You think China's in great shape? You yeah. don't think they're bleeding out a little bit? You don't Fair. think Germany's bleeding out right now? You think yeah. Greece is ready to take on Marvin Hagler? Right. I mean, again, any any fight, it doesn't matter if it's kindergartners fighting or two global superpowers. It's right. always a relative game. Right. And, you know, on an absolute basis, if currencies lose value, then you better own gold. And I'm a huge advocate of owning gold. But anything other than that, that, that holds its value absolutely, mm -hmm. it's a relative game. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a lot of people out there who mm -hmm. assume because of all the statistics that you just ran off, the U.S. can't possibly win. Mm -hmm. And they allocate their portfolio in a way um, that reflects that belief, I think are in for a very rude awakening. Mm -hmm. So so, so on that, Brent, um, to, to Matt's point, uh, I believe, as I understand, you know, your framework, you see the U.S. has the best probability of being the last man standing. Um, but what if that last man, what, what if the wounds that last man has taken are fatal? Right. So, well, so they might be. They might yeah. be. I'll have to. I'll have to deal with that problem when I get there. Yeah, and and that that's where I'm going here, right? So you know, this is this is the end of Gladiator, right? Maximus <laughs> wins, but you know, yeah. he he ends up dying, right? Mm -hmm. um, do you both see sort of a terminal? inevitability coming up here for, I guess I'd say fiat currencies in general, but but even the US dollar, the current regime, will, they'll have to, will there have to be some sort of monetary reset or, or regime change at some point? Or can you make <clears throat> the argument that this is a sustainable system? Brent, do you want to go first? Sure. So I, I would say it's not, there doesn't have to be a reset. I think that there likely will be. There doesn't have to be one. And I think, and the reason is because, what's the right way for me to say this without sounding too dark? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So there's a fantastic book that everybody should read. Uh, my friend Mike Green recommended it to me several years ago. And, you know, he told me to read it and I didn't read it. And like a year later, he asked me if I'd read it. And I said, I hadn't read it. And he basically about threw me off the, this uh, hike we were on threw me down the mountain, told me I had to read it. So I went and read it. And it's it's fantastic. It's called The Storm Before the Storm. And it compares uh, Rome or Italy, you know, the Roman Empire to the United States. And it shows all the parallels. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I can't even begin to tell you how many parallels they were. And this book took place between like 120 AD and 60 AD. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just, I, I just, I, I can't describe how, how perfect it was other than to just say, go read it and you'll understand what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. What, And people will say, yeah, see, the U.S. is Rome and it's going to fail. What people forget <clears throat> is that at from 120 to 60 BC, they hadn't even had Caesar yet. Mm -hmm. They haven't even had their dictators yet. And mm -hmm. I would argue that the United States hasn't even had its dictators yet. Mm -hmm. um, and that, to be honest, that's kind of my biggest fear. I don't talk about that too much, but that's probably my biggest fear. Not that we have World War III and the U.S. comes out uh, on the bottom, uh, but that what will be needed to be done to win World War III will almost necessitate a dictator in power afterwards. Mm -hmm. And that's a really bad situation to think about. <clears throat> and I, I don't like it. I'm not advocating for it. I hope to God I am wrong. I will hold up my hand and... <clears throat> I got it completely wrong if I did, and I will do backflips to celebrate the fact I was wrong. But I think that's the most likely, or or maybe not the most likely, but I think that's a very likely path on which we travel before we get to, you know, the springtime again. Mm -hmm. And and I think many people think that we're in this fourth turning that's going to be over in six months, and the spring is coming in 2024 and 2025, and 
by 2027, all will be right again. And I, ju I just don't think that's the case. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and so in that type of an environment, I think the U S or whoever the hegemon is, whoever comes out on top can enforce their will on the rest of the world, whether it makes sense economically or not. And, and as evidence, I will say, you know, would it make economic sense for that to be able to happen? No, not really. But the Soviet ruble lasted for 60 or 70 years, and it didn't make a lot of sense either. But it lasted a long time, mm -hmm. and it lasted through force. And, you know, again, people don't like me saying this, but that's kind of the real world. And, you know, that's that's what I'm trying to prove. That's what I'm trying. Those are the those are the variables I'm trying to think through, not mm -hmm. just the economic variables that would happen in a free market, because we don't live in a free market as much as I would love that we lived in a free market. We just don't. Mm -hmm. And I, I think what, what, what you got to think about going forward is what happens from a societal level, what happens from a governmental level, what happens from an economic level. Uh, I, I don't think it's just as simple as, you know, listing a bunch of, uh, you know, numbers on a spreadsheet and saying what mm -hmm. makes sense mathematically, because I, I think all sense is going to get thrown out the window. Yeah, I mean, gosh, Brent, I mean, we started off a green on most and we're going to end a green on most and it's not positive. And again, in an industry that's, that's really, you know, criticized for being sensational and doom and gloom, which I'm sick of too, because it's depressing. Whether we talk about 150 DXY or hyperinflation or the spreads on the treasuries and unemployment data and economic data, it's all important. But at the end of the day, you step back at 30,000 feet, we take a deep breath. How does this play out? I, I fully agree. I think the real risk isn't World War III, as, as risky as that is, and it's not to be underestimated, or really poor statesmen, or, or really mental midgets in our politics, left, right, or center. But uh, as I've said many times, and I've, and I've given lectures on this or presentations in English and in German throughout Europe, because they're more familiar with this history of Napoleon and the Weimar and Yugoslavia in the 90s, or, you know, again, I've said this with with Franco and Mussolini and Hitler, and certainly with Napoleon in the 1780s, if you step back from debates over uh, policy or debates over rates or debates over what the Fed does, if you look at just simple, stupid, because the stupid is very simple, metrics of humankind throughout history, and in some ways, philosophy, human nature, history, and markets are all verbunden. They're all connected. It's fascinating how each of these things are relevant to each other, and they do actually influence how we should look at our portfolios. Oh, I never trade on the macros. And, Yet, one thing I've seen as a student of history uh, is that without exception, whenever a country, a regime, a king, a democracy, or an empire, from Ming to Rome to today, finds itself in embarrassing, and we agree, embarrassing debt levels are already the case today, they inevitably have a market crisis or a financial crisis of some form, which leads to a currency crisis of some form, which leads to inflation of some form which then leads to social unrest of some form. And that social unrest is always responded to by the extreme political left or the extreme political right and more centralization. In my mind, the biggest fear, not coming, but already here, is extreme centralization. And again, not just the debate over central bank digital currency or the COVID lockdowns or real science versus bogus science or censorship or imprisoning different views or weaponizing the DOJ or all the things that are clearly ready for open debate that aren't even allowed. The very fact that we have a central bank that we have to spend all our time talking about and what they're going to do, because we both know dovish or hawkish, that's the direction rates go. That's the direction they price in markets. There's centralization everywhere. And I know with Adam, he, he brought it up before in the past in our last conversation, you know, this Oliver Anthony guy in Farmville, Virginia gets 90 million hits on a song that just talks about how downtrodden the average American feels. Well, that song is popular in France. It's popular in Germany. I, I travel around here from all these con con countries. I see the obviously the wealthiest class, but I always talk to the cab drivers and the people on the street because those are important people. And they're all saying the same thing in Dusseldorf or in Frankfurt or in Munich. They're saying in Farmville, Virginia, they're what the WTF. I mean, I, I just feel poor and poor. And there's more and more centralization. And there's literally fear of a Stasi like Germany where you can't speak your mind or you can't argue or you can't debate. So I think the fear isn't just the, the destruction of the currency, hyperinflation or overstrained currencies or a federal uh, system that's gone too far. I think it's just more centralization, which almost is as scary as another market crisis. But I do see and I'll end here, massive amounts of volatility, which makes it really hard for you as you're trading asset classes beyond precious metals. It's a massive responsibility. I don't envy it. And I, and I think they're really smart guys like you, long, short, 
diversified, truly diversified, actively managing, you're you're up against a real force here. You know, you really are. And and you have to have strong convictions. And I think they're really wonderful. But I think despite the market moves and the currency moves, our biggest fear is uh, is is centralization and human, all too human and very, at the end of the day, uh, historically, philosophically and politically dark. And that is ending on a dark note. And, I, and again, I hope I'm wrong. On <laughs> well, we're we're going to end on a, on a slightly <laughs> less dark. Yeah, note. we need we um, need to come up with something happy to say. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. I'm going to ask you guys real quickly about, yeah. You know, assets that make sense given your guys's <clears throat> worldview here real quick just to add a little bit of additional darkness <laughs> to your point there matt yeah. um so uh i interviewed um neil howe a uh, demographer who you know developed the whole fourth turning mm -hmm. framework and you know, he puts us right in the middle of a fourth turning right now and, and to your point matt he actually says that that increased centralized control is a characteristic of a fourth turning. It's what you see happen as the old system begins to fall apart. And what's interesting is, yeah, understandably, the power structure tries to assume more centralized control because it's trying to say what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, but interestingly, it's it's the populace that actually starts demanding more and more centralized control. They start demanding that the government yeah. uh, do more to address the, the the fault lines that are, you know, cracking wide open and the problems that have been festering. Right. So mm -hmm. it's very yeah. interesting that demand it's it's comes from the top and from the bottom um, in these yeah. areas. And, and Brent, to your fear about we maybe haven't even had the dictators yet. Um, talking right after Neil Howe, I talked to behavioral economist Peter Atwater, and he's very <laughs> worried about kind of the, you know, the erosion that's going on in, in the masses perceived prosperity. And he, he made a great analogy, which, which kind of haunts me when I think about it. He said, um, you know, if you stand out in the cold rain long enough, mm -hmm. you'll get in the car with anybody. Yeah. And he yeah. basically said that that's what history has shown is when the populace feels abandoned. I have his, and, I have his book right here. Uh, <laughs> actually, move it, move it over to the, no, there you there go. There it is. The, the yeah. confidence map. Yeah, exactly. So that may even be a quote from the book. I'm not sure, but, um, uh, yeah. you know, that is scary from a political standpoint because when you're, when your populace really begins to give up hope, they will turn to who, whoever is giving them a shred of any, right. Mm -hmm. yep. Mm -hmm. Um, and we've seen in the, in the, yeah. in the past how, you know, demagogues and, and, yeah. uh, uh, you know, disruptors, uh, and, and, you know, from, from Hitler to whomever, yeah. you know, th th those arrived out of periods where the populace was, was very despondent. Okay. So to end on a better note, hopefully, um, uh, you guys certainly agree on gold, uh, as an asset class that you think is prudent to own, given where you see the currencies headed both on a, um, relative and absolute, uh, basis going forward. Um, are there any other currencies, uh, sorry, currencies, uh, assets, <coughs> Now, that you think, or, or let's just say investing strategies that you think make sense for regular viewers, the people that are watching this video who are listening to you, kind of concerned about where the future is going based upon what you've laid out and are saying, okay, I don't want to be collateral damage on that path. Um, mm -hmm. What can I do to, to, to reduce my vulnerability? Um, mm -hmm. Brent, why don't we start with you and then Matt will end with you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, again, I think... I think the two most important assets to own right now is to have some cash on the sidelines. If you're a U.S. investor, it's just U.S. cash. If you're a, not a U.S. investor, if you live outside the United States and you have, I would recommend you have cash, but I would recommend you hold it in U.S. dollars. All right. Uh, and sorry, just to uh, be clear, when you say cash, you talk in T-bills, you talk in what? Yeah, I, I got to be careful what I say here because I'm I'm regulated by so many yeah, different yeah. agencies. Yeah, okay, so cash yeah, or cash equivalent. Yeah, I, I can't give specific recommendations, but I think you should have some very short-term liquidity of some kind that you're comfortable with. Mm -hmm. I, I think that it's better to be held in U.S. dollars than um, in foreign currencies. Uh, I think on the other end of the portfolio, everybody should own gold. Um, and I don't think you should worry whether it goes down today or it goes up tomorrow. Um, hopefully you're not buying it to use next week. Hopefully you're buying it to use in some kind of a crisis or down the road. And then I think, again, I, I think you should have some allocation to equities and real estate. Um, again, <coughs> everybody's a little bit different, but again, I, I, in general, I think the U S is going to outperform perform the rest of the world over the next call it two to three years, just like it's outperformed the rest of the world over the last two to three years. I don't think that's going to change dramatically. Um, and so, you know, I, if, if you believe that we're in an inflationary environment where cash is going to lose value, then you should have real assets. 
you know, again, we've already talked about gold, but equities are real assets too, because equities own, re, you know, property, plant, equipment, inventory, that typically rises versus uh, a, de, a devaluing currency. Um, I think if you have some productive real estate um, with low debt, I think that's a great investment. The problem is, is it's, it's not transportable and it's, pre, it's pretty easy to tax. Um, but again, I think, I think everybody should have a little bit of diversification. And the best thing that people can do right now is get rid of whatever dogma they are uh, currently ascribing to. Be open-minded, admit you can be wrong. Like I'll say right now, listen, I might be wrong on all this. I, I absolutely might be wrong. Uh, and in some ways, I hope I am. Uh, I was gonna say, I think I hope. I think you hope yeah. you're wrong on some of this. Yeah, stuff, right? and, yeah. And, and I and I think ev I think everybody uh, sh should have that same attitude. You got to have conviction, but you also got to be willing to admit that you're wrong and, and be nimble. I, I don't think anybody, whatever your plan is for the next five years right now, hopefully along the way, you have the ability to be nimble and, and, and pivot a little bit because I don't think you're going to be able to just do one thing and have it automatically work for the next five years. Mm -hmm. Got it. Okay. Two, two quick clarifications. One, because you, you were more positive on the U.S. When you talk about owning equities, I assume you favor U.S. equities more than you do rest of our <clears> equities? Yeah. I mean, I favor the big blue chip U.S. equities, you know, Coca-Cola, Philip Morris, J.P. Morgan, you know, Lockheed Martin, um, these big, big blue chip Dow type companies. Um, you know, those companies have overseas Revenue. So, if you want a little bit of international exposure, you're actually getting it by owning U.S. equities. Um, you know, and, and I'm I'm not against owning technology stocks. I think in the short term, all equities are going to pull back. Uh, but if we get it, especially if we get into another scenario like we did post COVID, I would much rather be invested in the United States than overseas. Mm -hmm. Okay, got it. And and uh, it, it sounds from some of the comments you made that. Um, I don't want to put words in your mouth here, but that the past 20 years have been great for passive investors, right? You could just buy the sector ETF, buy the dips, let it ride. I hear you saying, if I'm reading between the lines, active investing may be, become more important in the type of more volatile future we're heading into, and therefore take a much more active role in your portfolio management or find a, a portfolio manager who can actively manage your portfolio. Yeah, I, I, I would say that's right. And if, you, if you're going to have passive investments, I would have some kind of volatility overlay on it or somebody who's either hedging your exposure from time to time or providing some way to, to benefit from the swings um, rather than just having it on autopilot. Mm -hmm. All right, Matt, you're batting last here, buddy. Sure. No, I think I echo a lot of the same sentiments. I mean, uh, the, the biggest mistake I think that could be made right now, and I think we've talked about in other, in other conversations, is the risk parity portfolio, the diversified bond and diversified stock, passive ETF driven 60, 40, 70, 30 mindset. Because I think, I think uh, credits and equities are correlated rather than zigging and zagging to protect investors. So you really need to be very selective in your quality <clears throat> and have cash allocations and avoid that old uh, portfolio analysis, that passive portfolio analysis was good for our parents. It always works in a bull market. It's a disaster in a bear market <clears throat> because I do see a recession in play now and coming. I think, uh, yes, the right equities. I was listening to Bill Ackman talk about the right equities in a recession uh, because they're inflation protected, like fast food restaurants or hotels. My attitude is an inflation that's driven by money supply and not by demand uh, driven price hikes. Uh, those fast food restaurants and hotels aren't going to have a lot of revenues and a lot of clients. So i even Bill Ackman and I probably don't agree on that, but I do think uh, some of the kind of positions that Brent was talking about make more sense. I think investors should also be, you know, in addition to understanding active management <clears throat> with an overlay, protective overlay and a cash allocation, <clears throat> it's very important to understand, you know, what are you measuring your portfolio against? The S&P, that's, bo that's bogus. It should be some type of absolute return, whether that's 3%, 5%, 7%. Because again, as I've said beside in the past, if the S&P is down 30 and you're down 25, that's not a victory. You want to have something that really is actively managed and enough that there is a, a kind of a perpetual sense of risk rather than reward only thinking. The, the, the risk that I'm really thinking about in the equity markets, I'm not talking about gold because to me, gold always gets the last laugh. So it's not even worth discussing in this environment. But, you know, there's 720 <clears throat> billion dollars worth of corporate bonds that roll over in 2024. There's another 1.2 trillion that roll over in 2025 at higher rates. Low rates and debt was the rotten wing beneath the winds of the stock buybacks and the, and the extend and pretend wind behind the bull market of the S&P post 09. 
at the sovereign level, 33, 34 trillion now, the public debt, about 30%, 30% of that, so 17 trillion rolls over the next 36 months. That's really where the uh-oh moment comes in these risk asset markets, which active managers like Brent, I'm sure, are looking at when, when these when these when these rollovers occur in this higher for longer environment. Who knows what the higher for longer environment will be in six months? But again, we watch this very carefully. Brent does more carefully because he really has to be on top of it. But I think all those things are worth thinking about. <clears throat> and um, you know, I think it's important to have a macro view, but to Brent's point, I'll close with the same thing. That's what's wonderful about these conversations. We ultimately can agree on a lot. We can disagree. We can both be wrong. We can both be semi-right. I don't need to be right. I don't think Brent needs to be right. That's, I think that's a, a truer sign of real <laughs> wisdom in terms of what we can all be. It would be better if we all just learned to do that but not have to be emotional and right, but let's learn from each other. But I think um, these conversations are really important, and I think the dollar is really important. Obviously, I think gold is really important. But it's, I'm really grateful to you, Brent, because I've always wanted to ask you these questions about the the milkshake theory, which I have a tremendous respect for. And this gives me a lot to think about, too. You know, it really does. And yet, you know, I still probably stubbornly stick to my my views, but uh, it's a lot to think about. But ultimately, I think we're all got to think about volatility. We all need to educate ourselves and and not just believe our own views only and look at contrary views, whether that's Bitcoin, gold, stocks, bonds, rates, the Fed. I think it should we should challenge ourselves all the time and, and look at a different view because that gives us more conviction of the views we ultimately choose. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I couldn't agree more about the importance of conversations <clears throat> like this. And I really appreciate both of you coming on to have this discussion. I'm not even going to call it a debate, but this this co-exploration, which I think is just yeah. super Super valuable for the audience, and you guys gave us a ton of time. So, so thank you so much for doing that. Um, you mentioned Bitcoin. I can't tell you how many questions I got about digital currencies. We didn't even touch didn't on even that here. That, so, yeah. we yeah. may have to have you guys back on at some point for for round yeah. two of this. Um, yeah. As we wrap up, Matt, for folks that would like to follow you and your work from here, where should they go? Uh, GoldSwitzerland.com. Yeah, it's uh, mostly articles from Egon and my Egon von Greyers, my partner and colleague, and. Sometimes Ronnie Sturfel, our advisor, uh, throws in some good stuff in German and English for our audience. But goldswitzerland.com is the URL, and either either Egon or myself have an article up every week that uh, talks a lot about these themes as well. Awesome. And Brent, how about you? Um, I'm pretty active on Twitter. Uh, Santiago AU Fund is the, is the <clears throat> handle. If you just type in Santiago Capital in the search bar and look for a, a black seashell, uh, that's me. Um, also, we do a weekly podcast called uh, Milkshakes, Markets, and Madness. You can search for that on YouTube or just uh, there's an at Milkshakes pod handle on Twitter as well. And, you know, I'm just I'm going to sign off by saying, you know, I'm, I'm pretty lucky. Like, I kind of feel like I have the best job in the world um, because I get to talk about these things. I get to think about these things. And ultimately, I, I have the responsibility of managing other people's money. Mm. But if I had to switch spots with anybody in the world, it might be Matt. Because I think their business is one of the best in the world. So it's, this has been fun. Thank you, Brent. That's really That's nice. That's super, super high praise. Um, yeah. So, folks, look, if you've enjoyed this conversation, please thank these gentlemen showing your, uh, your gratitude by hitting the like button and then clicking on the red subscribe button below, as well as that little bell icon right next to it. Um, and please do subscribe because you, this is a new channel. This is still our first week, week and a half of operation. Uh, getting the subscriber numbers up really helps YouTube uh, pick up our content and share it with other like-minded, critical thinkers like you all. Um, and uh, if you want to find out what's coming next for this channel, um, I'm giving updates practically on a daily basis now over on my new Substack. If you want to sign up for that for free, just go to adamtaggart.substack.com. Um, Matt, Brent, guys, this has been a, a, a true joy. Uh, you guys are consummate professionals. What a wonderful discussion. Um, really look forward to having you guys back on this channel here. And again, just want to say too, as I've gone on this new independent venture, you guys have just been uh, incredibly generous uh, in your support and your goodwill. I want to thank you guys for that. But guys, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you, Adam. Thank you. All right, everybody else, thanks so much for watching.